I'm here with American comedian Kurt Metzger, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're very I'm, serious about our American comedy. Kurt? I'm glad you said that, actually. This time, I'm very happy you said I'm American comedian after seeing that Canadian YouTube comic. <laughs> yes. That, uh, oh, my God. So we've often talked about how the big pharma owns the media. They fund like 70 to 80 percent of the nightly news um, across the board. That's at Fox, too. Uh, so I just want to show you the conflicts of interest. <laughs> just maybe, I don't know. Maybe, and maybe some people who consider themselves lefty critics of the government, maybe they'll pick up on some of this. Maybe they won't. Uh, this is from Biospace. Scott Gottlieb joins Pfizer board weeks after departing the FDA. What? This is from, that was from July, 2019. Months after Scott Gottlieb stepped down from his role as commissioner, he was the commissioner of the U S food and drug, the FDA. He then found himself back in the world of pharma <laughs> as a member of Pfizer's board of directors. Are you shitting me? <laughs> That's not illegal. How did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> what a strange trip it's been. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, I was the chairman of the FDA and the next thing I know, I'm on the bar board of a giant <laughs> pharmaceutical company. I used to regulate. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I bet they just did a headhunt search. And I woke, uh, I woke up in the office and I had a series of tattoos on my body to tell me what happened. Because <laughs> I found myself. <laughs> oh, there I am. I found myself back in Big Bar. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I was going to go into mowing lawns. Next, <laughs> next thing you know, I wake up. I'm on the board of Pfizer. I got <laughs> turned around over here. Uh, before he was selected as the 23rd FDA commissioner by the White House, he served as a consultant to many companies, including Novo Nordisk, GlaxoSmithKline, and Daiichi Senkyo. Gottlieb also served on the boards of Grottles Inc., Combi Matrix Corp., and Aptive Solutions. What a better guy to be the commissioner of the FDA. A guy who's... <laughs> Who's literally has a corporation growing out of growing out of his asshole? This is the guy we want as the head of our Food and Drug Administration. Okay. As a member of Pfizer's board of directors, Gottlieb will earn a cash retainer retainer of about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year plus stock options in the company. So that means he doesn't have to do anything. That's what a retainer means. That means he doesn't have to he doesn't have to do anything. They just give him one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You know what that is, Jimmy? That's a producer credit in Hollywood. <laughs> yes, that's right. During his two-year tenure at the FDA, Gottlieb aggressively supported the approval of new branded drugs as well as generics. Additionally, he tackled multiple public health problems, including an opioid epidemic that has been sweeping the country and vaping. Again, uh, the opioid epidemic was caused by the ph big pharma companies that he's now serving, or has always been. <laughs> There has certainly been some criticism of Gottlieb's returning to the board of pharma company. You think? <laughs> has there been? Bi this is from Biospace. There's been, certainly been some criticism. <laughs> There's been a little bit of criticism. <laughs> Sidney Wolf, the former head of Public Citizen Health Research Group and critic of Gottlieb in the FDA, called the move classic. <laughs> <laughs> classic this guy's a legend he's classic philosophically <laughs> he's returning to the echo system where he's most comfortable and he'll get paid very well for it too wolf said according to stat news so how often does this happen <laughs> this is from science magazine this is from um J July 2018, <laughs> FDA's revolving door. Companies often hire agency staffers who manage their successful drug reviews. Job no. changes raise a conflict of interest. Questions. It raises a conflict <laughs> of interest questions. It raises I mean, questions. Wait, where's the conflict? I just see interest. <laughs> like yes, there's just interests. Exactly. <laughs> 
What I, I did this is the the there might might be a yeah, this the quest this is the co- textbook definition of corruption. Wait wait wait! It says science. You tell me, Doctor Fauci wrote this? Oh, <laughs> we I don't want to criticize science. So this again, this it raises the questions. No, this is the textbook definition of corruption and unethical behavior. There's another one. Uh, this is from ProPublica, which I love that name, ProPublica. <laughs> FDA repays industry by rushing risky drugs to market. What? Why would they do that? As pharma companies underwrite three-fourths of the FDA's budget for scientific reviews, the agency is increasingly fast-tracking expensive drugs with significant side effects and unproven health benefits. So I'm not allowed, again, by YouTube, I'm not allowed. I always, I'm like, so what if you're not allowed to contradict what the CDC or the FDA says about coronavirus or Fauci or the NIH? And I'm like, well, what if they're lying? I'm not allowed to contradict them if they're lying. No. But I guess they are at ProPublica. Go ahead. (laughs) It's called Progressive Stack, Jimmy. Now you, as a powerful male, can't punch down at Big Pharma and at uh, the FDA. I don't ever heard that term, Progressive Stack. Yeah, the, you know, from Occupy, where they determine who's... Oh, oh, okay. That was such a bad strategy thing to do. (laughs) The FDA's growing emphasis on speed has come at the urging of both patient advocacy groups and industry, which began in 1992 to contribute to the salaries of the agency's drug reviewers in exchange for time limits on reviews. No shit. So we'll give you some money if you speed up this process. So I no longer have the right to a speedy trial, but they have a right to to a a speedy trial. Drug review? Yes. They have a right to a speedy drug review. If it maybe they should start letting you pay for speedy court procedures. Maybe that would help. Oh my god. So uh back to this it says uh in twenty seventeen, pharma paid seventy five percent or nine hundred and five million dollars of the agency's scientific review budgets for branded and generic drugs, compared to just twenty seven percent in nineteen ninety three. Boy, how could that affect anything? This is from Forbes. The biopharmaceutical industry provides 75% of the FDA's drug review budget. Is this a problem? (laughs) I I don't know. Problem for who? Is it a problem for Big Pharma and Wall Street and the politicians that serve them? No. Is it a problem for everyone else? Yes. Yes. Is it, Oh, except the people who also own stock in Big Pharma. So if you own stock in Big Pharma, not a problem. Your portfolio is doing very well. And if you work for Big Pharma, you're doing very well. And if you work for the media companies or the being a politician who serve them and are paid by them, then that, that, it's not a problem. But it is a problem for people like me and you. Hey, by the way, look at here. The uh, regulatory capture of the FDA. This is from the American conservative. Even the American conservative can see this shit. What year is this from? <laughs> this is from this year, 2021. <clears throat> Holy shit. Even the American conservative is co- wow. Uh Ma- this guy who wrote this is is Maxim Jacobs. He's a managing partner and director of research for North America for Edison Group, an investment research investor relations and consulting firm. So even this guy can tell the truth about the FDA. Look at this. He goes, this week, three members of an 11-member FDA advisory committee of experts resigned in protest over the FDA's approval of Adulhelm. That's for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. These resignate. This is from June of this year. Did, 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 Did this get any publicity? These restrictions are extremely unusual. These resignations are extremely unusual, but in this case, understandable. Why? Well, Adhulem, Aduhelm, is that how you say it? Aduhelm? Aduhelm. Adhelms. Aduhelms. Adhelms was approved <laughs> by the agency despite the fact that both pivotal trials were stopped early because they were judged to be futile. The FDA's own statistical reviewer did not support approval, and the FDA advisory committee reviewing the application voted it down overwhelmingly. These are the same motherfuckers you're trusting with all this stuff around COVID. 
Even all that happened. Everybody was against it at every step. What happened? Well, and additionally, in a survey conducted by Endpoint News, whose readership is heavily weighted at biopharmaceutical industry staffers and executives, over 80 percent considered the approval to be a bad idea. So how did that drug on June 7th, how did it get approval? Well, two words, regulatory capture. What's that, Jimmy? Regulatory capture is defined as when a supposedly objective regulatory agency ends up promoting the ends of the industries that they are regulating. The FDA has been <laughs> captured for quite a while. That's what it means? I thought it meant when people who are smarter than you and me decide <laughs> to do something. <laughs> <laughs> In 2016, in a 2016 study published in the British Medical Journal, the majority of the FDA's hematology oncology reviewers who left the agency ended up working or consulting for the biopharmaceutical industry. No shit. Well, imagine my chagrin. In another investigative investigation by Science Magazine, 11... Of the 16 FDA reviewers who worked on 28 drug approvals and subsequently left the agency are now working or consulting for the companies they just got done regulating. 11 of the 16. Hey, regulate for the job you want, not the job you have. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> for example, let's give you an example. Dr. Thomas Lauren a former director of psychiatric products for the FDA who had a history of less than objective actions while at the agency. He left the FDA in 2012. He started a consultancy to help companies focused on psychiatric products navigate the regulators approval process. One of these companies is AstraZeneca maker of Seroquel. He was instrumental in getting Sarah Quell a broader approval in 2009, going so far as to personally minimize questions about cardiac risk related to the drug at an FDA advisory committee meeting. After approval, however, there was no hiding from these side <sighs> effects and a warning label had to be added to the drug in 2011. Now let's go back to Aduhelm in March of 2019, Biogen's two identically designed randomized controlled studies looking at Aduhelm in mild Alzheimer's patients were stopped due to the Data Safety Monitoring Board judging them to be futile and unlikely to produce a clinically meaningful benefit. Then in October of that year, Biogen announced that after receiving additional data from one of the trials, they decided to file for an approval of the high dose tested with the FDA. This, despite the fact that the benefit was only seen in trial 302, while in trial 301, patients on the high dose actually did worse than patients on placebo, even the pool data combining that from both trials did not show a significant benefit for the high dose. After Biogen made the decision to move forward, the company then went to work on the narrative. At the Clinical Trials on Alzheimer's Disease Conference in December 2019, during a session to discuss the data, no skeptics or even statisticians were given a platform to speak. Additionally, no open question and answer segment was allowed, and all microphones were removed from around the room. This was highly unusual, especially given that question and answer sessions are the rule at a medical conference. Even more shocking was that Biogen and the FDA released joint briefing documents for the meeting of the FDA Advisory Committee, a panel of experts convened prior to a drug's approval, to discuss the safety and efficacy of the drug. In my 22 years looking at the biotechnology sector, <clears throat> I don't remember this ever happening. Typically, the FDA has one set of briefing documents where they discuss the data from their point of view, and the company has a different set. Despite this questionable degree of collaboration, if not collusion, the meeting did not go well for Biogen. The FDA statistician at the meeting, Dr. Tristan Massey, concluded that the evidence was conflicting and that approval might actually negatively impact the development of more effective treatments. 
the advisory committee shared his the advisory committee shared his view and on the question uh, and on the key question regarding whether trial 302 provided evidence of effectiveness of the drug not a single committee member voted yes and 10 voted no one abstained a pretty overwhelmingly negative response to this freaking drug and yet the FDA approved it effing anyway. Even worse, the actual drug label, which is what physicians and patients review when considering a drug, it reads like it was written by Biogen's marketing team. First, the label indicates that it is approved for the treatment of all stages of Alzheimer's disease, even though it was only tested in mild patients and had meager efficacy even there. This greatly inflates the addressable market size, as now all 6 million Americans with Alzheimer's are eligible for this drug. Whoa, that sounds like an old Brittle Star bit. Yeah. <laughs> Given the company decided to price the drug well ahead of any projections at $56,000 per patient per year, this drug could be a real budget buster. They said a fair price, but the Clinical and Economic Review Institute said a fair price would be around twenty five hundred to eighty three hundred dollars. But they still wanted to charge fifty six thousand because they're good people over at Big Pharma. Wait, per pill or per year? Per year. Oh, per oh. year, per person, per year. Oh, that's quite a jump. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, yes, that's quite a jump. And this 6 million patient estimate only includes people over the age of 65. Hence, they will be covered by Medicare, specifically Medicare Part B, as is an infusion. In 2019, total spending by Medicare Part B was $37 billion. If just 15% of patients with Alzheimer's decided to go on Aduhelm, that would equal $50 billion in spending. Why did the FDA do all of this? Besides the usual incentives for post-FDA careers, because they're going to get a frickin' job at a big pharma place after they leave the FDA. Also, there were likely political considerations at work. Like what? Well, less than two weeks prior to the approval, President Joe Biden said that if we don't do something about Alzheimer's in America, every single hospital bed will be occupied in the next 15 years with an Alzheimer's patient. Again, fear-mongering. That's what big pharma does. Guess which 2020 candidate was the largest recipient of campaign funds by a large margin from Biogen and affiliated parties? Well, that would be Joe Biden, the guy who just scared the shit out of you. He got $76,241. Biogen also significantly increased their lobbying ahead of the FDA decision, which with 2020 being a record year and 2021 being a record first quarter. I have a lot of respect for the FDA. And I think the vast majority of reviewers are looking to do the right thing, but the system is broken and there needs to be more firewalls to insulate the FDA from manipulation. In 2006, a 2006 survey of FDA scientists indicated that 18.4% of them had been asked for non-scientific reasons to inappropriately exclude or alter technical information or their <clears throat> conclusions in an FDA scientific document. I have to imagine a similar survey wouldn't show any better results today. I'm going to guess much, much worse. So, okay. Kurt, how surprised are you at all this? I'm Well, I took a positive is that at least he still has his respect for the FDA in time. <laughs> <laughs> was it that nice? It did all. Oh, really, he didn't lose his religion. <laughs> he still loves this FDA, which is completely corrupted. Isn't that great? Uh, wow. I, yeah, I I was uh, giggling a lot, and then it just got real. It's like you can't. Each part is worse than the last part. I should go on. And if we and if you question those same criminal motherfuckers, you're immediately branded an anti-science, anti-vaxer. You're a real prick. For you're and a prick. And if you don't want to do what they say, you're an anti-science, anti-vaxer, and a real prick. That's what. That's those people. Yeah, you're a vaccinated anti-vaxxer, the worst kind. Uh, the wor oh. <laughs> like is a the black white supremacist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, I don't know who what other YouTube shows you're watching, but I'm guaranteeing the one you're watching aren't giving you a critique of fucking big pharma 
of Fauci, of the NIH, of the FDA, of the 100% corrupt country we're living in, and the corporate capture of our regulatory agencies. And they're not giving you any critique on anything of the vaccine rollout, of anything Fauci's saying, Joe Biden, the white, they're not doing any of that. Why is it that a comedian, why is it that this comedian and Russell Brand, he's the also a comedian, <laughs> are the only two prominent people on YouTube that consider themselves left that are doing this. Of course, Max Blumenthal. Why is that? What are they? Because they're all a bunch of fucking nutless wonders. They're all a bunch of fucking nutless wonders. They're going to tell you to vote for these same criminals that gave you this situation. They're going to do it and they're going to never stop doing it. Why? I'm telling you why. They're fucking nutless wonders. That is why. I got to go on stage every night as a comedian and stick my chin out and get it kicked in by a hundred drunks. So that's why I have a little more nuts than those fucking pukes that you're also watching. In fairness, those drunks are more reasonable, kind-hearted people than your average Twitter social media comedian. (laughs) You can reason with a comedy audience. (laughs) You can't reason with Twitter people who are in the Democratic Party cult. There's no reasoning with those people. And uh, by the way, this is a just Demo- this is bipartisan. Right now, the Democrats are complete control. If the Republicans were in complete control, they'd be doing the same goddamn thing. Although Trump says he wouldn't push mandates, but he did say he got his booster. Yeah, it's a true. The reason I got vaccinated was because Trump said it's terrific. Is that bad? I got it, but not for the right reason. <laughs> I didn't show my work right. <laughs> oh, that still makes you a prick. You're yeah. still a prick. You did no, it because no, Trump a booster said. Trump said. No, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to not like Trump and still get the booster. Uh, yeah, and now I like kid cages because they're Bidens. Yes, that's all I, I do. switch when I'm supposed to. <laughs> I switch when I'm supposed to. I switch my principles. Yeah. So uh, uh, did you really get a booster? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> I mean, not for all, the Omicron thing. So crazy. You, you know, you're not the only person like the information is out that it's not that certain. Here's what blows my mind when I especially when I watch you talk about this is you're quoting the actual people you're supposed to listen to. And, and what becomes apparent is. You're not even supposed to be paying attention to those people. You're supposed to just do the thing we said. Yes. Don't pay attention to what Fauci said. Like, just know this is what we're saying now. And not only are you not supposed to read it, you're supposed to not remember it. <laughs> like, I've never, it's like, I'm not even bright. I can remember things. <laughs> like, I'm trying not to. I smoke a lot of pop, but it doesn't work. You're not supposed to remember that Fauci lied to you about mass, herd immunity, gain of function, uh, two weeks to flatten the curve. This gives you sterility. If you get uh, vaccinated, you go back to your regular life, blah, blah, blah. We're going to end the pandemic. They, they, Jimmy, they, do you remember? I, I mean, I just thought this, I was talking to somebody the other day. At the beginning of this, it was racist to even worry that coronavirus, that it was a thing. If you were even worried about the virus at all, that's that right. was racist. Because Nancy Pelosi went to Chinatown in San Francisco in February and told people, come down to Chinatown. Don't be a ra-. That's right. You are 100% yeah, I, right. Isn't that wild? And now those same people are like online going, lock us down, daddy. Those same people. <laughs> well, those same people who think it's horrible to uh, show a, a, an ID to go vote. Those are the same people who want you to have to show an ID to eat chicken parmesan. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't even think. <laughs> what? No ID to vote, but ID to get a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any problem with that. You should have a chip in your arm to get a yes. To go see Spider Man. <laughs> wait till they start. Wait till they start mandating chips. Wait till you see those people who are pro chip mandators. I bet that's coming. I'm sure. I'm sure. It'll it's, just make my life easier if I'm just chipped. Why? Don't be a prick. Don't be a prick. Get chipped, right? Well, that'll that'll be the why same. Why are you afraid? Were you a January sixth? <laughs> ah! Oh, you see, Bob's Burgers fired that guy who was at January sixth. I call a friend who knows he didn't get banned. That that article is also sensational and stupid. I mean, he might have been at the thing, but the thing of he's banned and all that. That's all like media. That's not nonsense. real. I think they. I think they just don't know where he is right now. That's oh, okay. Oh, he but maybe went underground. <laughs> I don't know. It's crazy to me. I was oh, a big okay. fan of Mr. Show, so it was just wild to me. Like, 
why like even if you thought first of all if you're mad because you think the election is rigged like what did you not know it was rigged <laughs> like what, what, do you, don't you remember al gore and and george bush like when the hell did you think it wasn't when is it to- they're all rigged the, the, the first of all you the, the, you got the um electoral college is the biggest rigor yeah what do you think that is well i think they don't <laughs> understand the word rigged to them means like russia reprogrammed the oh machine. you know what i mean i i don't think when i say rigged i mean the entire system is set up yes to push it one way or the other they don't really even have to do hacking and so i'm sure that happens too but it's rigged. It's so obviously rigged, and it has been. Why do you think there's only two parties? Why, why do you think there's only two parties? Why do you think Joe Biden is our president? You don't think that's a rigging? You don't think that? So in China, we oh, the party gets to pick who you get to vote for. In America, Wall Street does. <laughs> yes, well, that's right. Wall Street gets to pick. Do you think that we we're going to get a candidate that Wall Street was against? That's why we didn't get Bernie Sanders. We got Joe Biden, and before that, we got Hillary Clinton. We're never going to get... We, we Our candidates are selected for us by corporations and Wall Wall Street, the the literally that's selected. Not- I'm not making this up. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama's entire cabinet came from an email from inside Citigroup. <laughs> His entire cabinet was released by Wiki, revealed by WikiLeaks, came from an email from Citigroup. That's who chooses the presidency and our governments. Kurt, go ahead. I just th- like we think of all the things of China that you hear that I don't want to be here. But I mean, it's amazing. They're going to we're going to have I, I don't even want to look up how their elections work because I'm afraid it's going to, I'm afraid I'm going to see it's really not that much worse than all Right. Ours. Like I'm, I, I actually don't want to know uh, it, like what that is. Like it, we actually have in some way, oh, here's something I like about China. I know where I'm like, don't make me love you, China. When, uh, <laughs> when a billionaire starts, starts trying to flex influence, they, he just disappears. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's good legally, but emotionally I have to say it's very appealing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, Bill Gates just disappeared. Now he doesn't have all these ambitions to be a farmer anymore. Huh? Farmland's going back to the farmers in America, and that's something. When that wouldn't that be something? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you can just spend your stupid billions of dollars there. Because what what are you going to do with billions of dollars? You, buy crap. That's all you're allowed to do there. You're not allowed to influence how the country <laughs> goes. Because right. that's what the billions are for. That is what the billions are for. So you can have power. So yeah. why does why does Bill Gates and, and Jeffrey uh, Be- Jeff Bezos and Jeffrey Katzenberg why do they still want to make more billions for power? That's what it is. That's at that point you're never going to spend that money. You could I, I dare you to try to spend a billion dollars, let alone a hundred of them. Everybody come see our live stand-up shows. We're coming to Raleigh, North Carolina at the end of January and Philadelphia in February. See you there.